Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Fall 2018 Speech Showcase presented by the Department of Communication at Weber State University. Tonight, we will be honoring the finest speakers from our COM 1020 public speaking program, a general education course that is taken by majors from across the university. Before we begin the program this evening, there are several individuals who need to be acknowledged for the help and the efforts that they have put forward in making the speech showcase a continued success for the department and for the university. We begin tonight by recognizing interim president, Norm Tarbox. Pro Provost Madon Minor. <laughs> Dean Scott Springer of the Talitha E. Lindquist College of Arts and Humanities. <laughs> Dr. Cherie Josephson, Chair of the Department of Communication. <laughs> Dr. Adrian Andrews, Chief Diversity Officer for Weber State University. Brent Parkin, Director of Development for the Talitha E. Lindquist College of Arts and Humanities. <laughs> and this semester's recipient of the Freedom Through Rhetoric Award, Mr. Mark Merkley. Yeah. Tonight we also would like to recognize the selection committee who made this event possible. Four individuals who gave tirelessly of their Saturday morning to listen to the speeches delivered by the contestants who we'll be hearing from tonight. They are Dr. Cherie Josephson, Chair of the Department of Communication. <laughs> Dr. Colleen Berg, Professor in the Department of Communication. Dr. Bobby Van Gelder, Assistant Professor in the Department of Communication. And Professor Leslie Howerton, an instructor in the Department of Communication. At this time, as it has been our custom, may I ask that any instructor of COM 1020, past or present, please rise to be recognized as well. recognition to all of these instructors who are mentoring and creating the speakers who we are hearing tonight. It is through their efforts that the students are celebrated for their fantastic acts of rhetoric. We thank the instructors who have given tirelessly to make this event a possibility. The speech showcase began in spring of 2015 as an event that was designed to commemorate and to celebrate performances of rhetoric among the students in the Department of Communications basic course, COM 1020. These public speaking students are not all communication majors. In fact, many are not. They come from all colleges and all majors across the university. Throughout the semester, these students are giving five speeches within their COM 1020 course. The culmination of this course is to nominate one speaker per section of COM 1020 to compete on the Selection Saturday event that precedes the main event for the speech showcase. Every semester, the instructors of COM 1020 nominate their best speaker from their class to be the representative of that entire class of speakers. Each class holds approximately 25 speakers, giving us over 600 speakers that we may choose from that are narrowed down to 25 and ultimately a panel of five finalists who you will hear this evening as in semesters past. 
at this time, given the fact that the speech showcase has now run for eight semesters, I would like to ask any participants in the speech showcase, including this semester and previous semesters, to rise and to be recognized. We thank those who made the special effort to be here this evening, who had been finalists and competitors over the past eight semesters. At this time, it is important that we recognize the class representatives who are here this evening and who will be given their awards for being selected as a class representative. When I call your name, if you will please come forward, and may I ask that Dr. Josephson come up front, who will be presenting the certificates for the classroom participants. May we begin tonight with Dallin Arby. Sterling Barlow. <laughs> Megan Coles. <laughs> Jessica Davis. Dylan <laughs> Sequoia Dixon <laughs> Peter Eck Riley Farron. <laughs> Anthony Frazier. <laughs> Rebecca Gonzalez. Ashley Guyman. <laughs> Emma Harris. <laughs> Lucy Kunzler. Marissa Rodriguez. Jordan Salati. And Sydney Steele. to all class representatives. Before we proceed to hear from our five finalists, I need to give a special recognition to two individuals who, behind the scenes, have made tonight a possibility. The individuals are our department administrative assistants, Sherry Love and Sari Gardner. A big round of applause. And a final special recognition to a gentleman who has done most of what you do not see tonight. The gentleman who has prepared Selection Saturday, who has made the reservations for students, who has gathered all students here and ensured that they would be representing their classes, Mr. Brent Warnock.
At this time, it is my pleasure to begin the main event of the speech showcase for fall 2018. We will have our five finalists give their presentations this evening in the order listed in the program. Our first speaker tonight is Peter Eck. Peter was born in Ogden and still calls Ogden home today. He's a political science major and a sophomore here at Weber State University. He hopes in the future to attend law school and to work in government or some element of politics. Peter attended Ogden High School and served an LDS missionary mission in Washington, D.C. He returned at the end of August, a full three days before the beginning of the semester. <laughs> Peter's instructor for COM 1020 is Mr. David Collins. Tonight, he will be presenting a speech that is titled, The Importance of Political Participation. Peter is going to be mic'd and he will join me in just a moment. Let us give Peter a big round of applause. said, nobody will ever deprive the American people of the right to vote except the American people themselves. And the only way that they could do that is by not voting. Sadly, today, more and more Americans seem to be depriving themselves of their right to vote and the chance to participate in our wonderful democracy. Today, I want to discuss the problem with low voter turnout and how we can work to improve this, pro this problem and how that can help to keep our democracy in the United States strong. So I want to begin by talking about the problem with voter turnout. Prior to the year 1900, the United States actually had relatively high voter turnout. About 80% of eligible voters participated in elections up until the year 1900. However, since 1900, and especially since 1960, voter turnout has decreased significantly. Since 1960, only 57% of eligible voters have participated in presidential election voting. And when we talk about the midterm or non-presidential elections, it's even lower, with only about 41% participating. This data comes from the United States Election Project, which, um, which specializes in keeping track of elections and our turnout. And now I want to talk specifically about my generation because we turn out at an even lower level to vote. In the 2016 presidential election, even with all the media attention surrounding it, only 43% chose to participate and vote. And in the 2014 midterm election, a dismal 17% came out to vote. Now, what's the problem with these low turnout numbers? There's some who feel that there isn't a problem with it. There are some who will argue that only the most informed and only the most passionate about politics and government should make the decisions about who our leaders should be. However, I would disagree with these people because democracy is not about the few, but it's about the many. And America is at its greatest when its citizens are informed and participating in the political process. So how can we work to overcome this problem? It seems like a lofty goal to go from 17% turnout for millennials and young people up into 100%. However, there's things that each of us can do to ensure that our democracy stays strong and to improve turnout in the United States. One of the most important things that we can do is be informed citizens. I wouldn't stand here and advise or argue that people who are uninformed or don't know much about the issue, they're the candidates, should go out and vote. What I would say is that these people, each of us, can make the decision to be informed citizens, to learn about the issues that are relevant to our country today, and to get to know the candidates who are running for our local offices and our national offices. Because as we do this, we'll be able to make informed decisions that will bless our country and will allow us to participate in democracy. 
Something else that each of us can do is participate by registering to vote. Now, I'll admit that there are institutional problems across the country that can make it difficult for people to register to vote. However, in the state of Utah, I'm very glad to say that the process of registering to vote is relatively an easy process. We can register even up until election day and then go and vote on election day. It's easy, we can go online and we can register. And as we take this simple step, it will allow us to be a part of the process and to help our state and our country to pick leaders who can help us to move forward and to be at our greatest. Lastly, I want to talk for a minute about the state of our political process. A lot is said today about politics in the United States, how it's contentious, how we're divided, and how no one can seem to agree on anything. However, I feel that this is partly a problem because of the low voter turnout. When only those who are most interested and most passionate choose to show up and vote, then we're left with a polarized country. We're left with people who are on the extreme side, either right or left, and they argue and they fight it out. However, many of us may find ourselves more in the middle. And even though the idea of jumping in the political process may not interest us or may even seem daunting to us, I can promise that it will be the best thing for our democracy because everyone's voice needs to be heard. I speak especially to those of my generation, the young people, millennials, our voice needs to be heard. We have opinions and ideas that are needed now in our country, and we need to play an important part in electing our next leaders and eventually in becoming the next leaders of our country. As we do this, as we become informed citizens, as we register to vote, and as we ultimately participate in the process by casting votes based on our opinions and our values, the United States will remain a strong and brave country, and the state of our democracy will be better for it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Our second speaker this evening is Anthony Frazier. Anthony was born in Aiea, Hawaii, still calls it home, but here at Weber State University is a math major in his sophomore year. He hopes to, in the future, work in data science, perhaps as a statistician, and he attended Aiea High School, uh, with one being one of 230 in his graduating class. He is a member of Math Factor, a math club here on campus, the tennis club, and InterVarsity, an on-campus Christian club. Anthony's instructor is Dr. Stephanie Gomez, and the title of his presentation this evening, Drug Legalization, the Solution to Overcrowded Prisons. Anthony. society is an addictive society. And whether it be social media or video games, there's a lot of addictions that as a society we've learned to accept. One addiction that has affected humanity for centuries has been our addiction to drugs. And in the United States, we've held the notion that in general, drugs should be prohibited. We often take this notion for granted and never really question is this notion right, and does it benefit our society? So because I believe we should always challenge the status quo, I argue that the United States should legalize the use and possession of all drugs. I'll prove this in three points. First, I'll go over a couple issues that affect the United States, and then talk about how drug legalization solves those issues. Lastly, I'll bring up a couple different advantages that come with drug legalization. 
1971, President Richard Nixon enacted our nation's war on drugs, a war that is best characterized as both ineffective and costly. So the first problem with the war on drugs is that it's been ineffective. And the first way that we know that is the increase in our prison population. According to the Federal Bureau of Prisons in October of this year, ever since 1980, our prison population has increased sixfold, and that has caused the overpopulation problem we see in the United States today. The overpopulation problem is so bad that across the nation, the occupancy rate averages at 103.9%. The main cause of this is drug offenses. According to the Federal Bureau of Prisons in September of this year, nearly half of all offenses in the United States were for drug crimes alone. The second way we know that the war on drugs has been ineffective is that it hasn't solved any of the issues underlying the underlying drug addiction. According to the Center for American Progress, within the first two weeks of their release, prisoners are at a 129% greater chance of dying from drug overdose death compared to the general public. Obviously, incarcerating these individuals is doing nothing to solve the issues underlying drug addiction. The second problem with the war on drugs is that it's, is that it's costly, and according to the Cato Institute, in 2018, across all states and the federal level combined, $47.9 billion are spent annually on a drug prohibition enforcement. And according to drugwarfacts.org in 2018, in the terms of the federal budget, very little is actually spent on preventative and curative measures for drug addiction. Therefore, a solution is needed. And although drug legalization may seem counterintuitive at first, it would actually prove to be the perfect solution to these problems. So first let's talk about overpopulation. Drug legalization would solve the overpopulation problem because as drugpolicy.org notes in 2017, 85% of individuals who are convicted for drug crimes are convicted for possession alone. Therefore, the legalization of the use and possession of drugs would get rid of the overpopulation problem and save our failing prison systems. The next, um, the next thing that comes with drug legalization is improving our economy. So not only would we gain tens of billions or save tens of billions of dollars each year not having to spend money on drug prohibition enforcement, but we would also gain tens of billions of dollars from potential tax revenue. Again, the Cato Institute article I cited earlier goes on to note that $58.8 billion could be raised potentially by taxing these legal drugs. Not only does drug legalization solve the issues in the status quo, it also brings a couple additional benefits. The first being a decrease in violence. So the first way we know that drug legalization decreases violence is that in the status quo, um, drug prohibition enforcement is currently um, increasing violence within the illegal drug trade. So Alison Schrager notes in 2013 that um, drug prohibition mainly targets supply. So because it doesn't target the demand, and what ends up happening is that supply decreases. When supply decreases, the price level of the drugs increase. An increase in the price level makes drugs more profitable and therefore brings in more, um, brings in more violence into the illegal drug trade. That same article goes on to note that research over the past several decades um, concludes that there's a positive correlation between an increase in drug prohibition enforcement as well as homicide rates. The second way that we know that drug legalization would decrease violence is simply looking at empirical evidence from Portugal. They legalized the use and possession of drugs in 2001 within their own nation, and according to Samuel Oakford in 2016, they saw that in terms of overdose deaths, it decreased from 80 in 2001 to only 16 in 2012. Additionally, drug use actually fell after legalization and now averages with the EU. Therefore, we can see that drug legalization would decrease the amount of violence we see in our own country. Not only would we see a decrease in violence, however, we would also be able to have more research opportunities to figure out how exactly these drugs work. Rob Hodekinen wrote in an article in 2014 that marijuana for research purposes comes from the hands of the government and is based in one 14-acre lot based in the University of Mississippi at Oxford. So there's two main problems with this. One, there's obviously a very short supply of drugs that's supposed to be used for research purposes across the nation. Additionally, because it's distributed by the hands of the government, it's left open to lobbying and therefore compromises the research, property, uh, research process and makes it potentially biased. Therefore, drug legalization would not only increase research, research opportunities, but it will also increase non-biased research opportunities. 
overall, the solution to the problems we see in the status quo is clear. Not only would drug legalization get rid of the overpopulation problem in our prisons, it would also improve our economy. Additionally, it would decrease violence and allow more research opportunities into the effects of these drugs. In the 21st century, we've become more accepting of all kinds of addictions. And now it's time to decriminalize our nation's addiction to drugs. Thank you, Anthony. Our third speaker this evening is Emma Elizabeth Harris. Emma was born in Tucson, Arizona, and currently calls Layton her hometown. She is a communication major with an emphasis in interpersonal and family communication. She is a junior at Weber State University, and she hopes in the future to be a motivational and inspirational professional speaker. She attended Northridge High School and has worked for four years in the, as the High Adventure Scout Base Camp. Her instructor for COM 1020, Mr. Brent Warnock, and the official title of her presentation tonight, Just Breathe. have a powerful effect on our minds, bodies, and souls. Earlier this year, I was experiencing more anxiety than I have in my entire life, and it was affecting me in many ways. When I started thinking about returning to school, I would get so stressed and overwhelmed, worried whether or not I could even afford to go to college, or if I did, how I could be successful in my classes. At work, my mind felt so unclear and fuzzy, and I was stressed that one potential wrong move could get me fired. Dating, well, I was very much single and ready to get nervous around anyone that I found attractive. And ultimately, I was just kind of a crying mess all the time. But thankfully, I've been blessed with a very wonderful and wise mother who's actually here tonight. Hi, Mom. And she taught me about the importance of deep breathing, specifically deep breathing and how it relates to the vagus nerve. She taught me about Dr. Ariella Schwartz, a licensed clinical psychologist who uses deep breathing as well as the vagus nerve in her practice with her clients who suffer with things such as depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Now, the vagus nerve starts in your brainstem and moves down through the body. It goes through your stomach and intestines, up into your heart and your lungs, and into your throat and your facial muscles. And it creates this constant communication because throughout all of this, you have nerve fibers that connect back to the vagus nerve, which connects back up to the brainstem and the brain. And so this constant two-way communication is how your body knows that you need certain things. So like it's how you know, um, it's how your body knows to release chemicals. It's why you have that fight or flight um, instinct. It's that uh, lump in your throat or that pit in your stomach. And because of this two-way constant communication, I guess you could say that what happens in the vagus nerve does not stay in the vagus nerve. <laughs> now, obviously, it can be difficult to influence your nervous system. However, through research, they have found that the best way to influence your vagus nerve is through deep breathing. When we're able to slow down our deep er, our breathing from 15 breaths per minute to about five to seven breaths per minute, that communication is able to happen. And our body does what it needs to do to relax. Um, so our body is able to do what it needs to do to relax. So when we take that deep breath and our stomach and our diaphragm expand, Endorphins are released in our mind, and it moves throughout the body. Your mind is able to become clear, and your heart rate can slow down, and your stomach's able to relax. Dr. Schwartz compares uh, our day-to-day -day experiences to what she calls the Goldilocks Principle. Oftentimes, we're either too hot or too cold. Too hot, we're emotional, we're anxious and stressed, or we're too cold, we're depressed. They'll cut off from the world. Through deep breathing, we're able to get our mind, our body, and our soul just right. 
Now it's your turn. I want every single one of you to practice deep breathing for the next 30 seconds. Get comfortable in your seat. Maybe unfold your legs or uncross your arms. You can look at a spot right in front of you or close your eyes, whatever feels best. But I want you to breathe in your nose and out your mouth for the next 30 seconds, starting now. Thirty seconds, seconds is up. Now, I want you to think about how you feel. Your mind probably feels a little bit more clear, or you can feel more energized. Maybe that heart rate has slowed down, and maybe the weight that you're feeling before has gone a little bit lighter. Now, that was just 30 seconds. I want you to think about what one minute could do, or even two minutes. For me, setting aside two minutes every single day to practice deep breathing has truly changed my life, mind, body, and soul. I can go on dates now and just relax and be myself. I don't worry as much about school because I know that through my hard work and dedication, I can be successful in all of my academic pursuits. My mind is much more clear and I can think a lot harder and I can get a lot more done in a shorter amount of time. And ultimately, I just feel better and I just live my life and do the things that I want to do. Now we all have stress and anxiety. No one's immune to it. Next week is finals week, and all professors and students can feel that pressure. However, I can promise you, if you go home today and you practice deep breathing for just two minutes, not only will you start to feel better, but you will start to be better because deep breathing can have a powerful, transformative effect on our minds, bodies, and souls. Emma. Our fourth speaker in tonight's program is Lucy A. Kunzler. Lucy was born in Ogden, Utah, and currently calls Pleasant View and Ogden her home. She is a communication major in the public relations and advertising track. A junior here at Weber State University, Lucy plans to attend law school and seeks to become involved in public relations for the Utah Jazz. She attended Weber High, graduating in 2013, and served an LDS mission to Taipei, Taiwan. She also formerly served on LDS Institute Student Committee. Her instructor for COM 1020 Stephanie Heath, forgive me, Dr. Stephanie Heath, and her presentation this evening is titled, Pages Before Post. That, according to Time Magazine, is the amount of minutes that Americans ages 20 to 35 are spending reading every single day. And even worse than that, according to the Washington Post, only 43% of Americans in an entire year read even one book, novel, or short story. Research across the board shows that reading has been, a, has been on a decline over the years. One way that the effects of this can be seen is through something known as the Gutenberg parentheses. The Gutenberg parentheses essentially shows us that we are actually reverting back to ways of communication and verbal skills that we had before written text. Now I know many of you may be thinking, so what, I don't have time to read or I just don't like to. And to that I would like to remind you of the average four hours that we're spending on our phones every day. So you have a little bit of time. Now some of you also may be saying and are a little more honest 
to the fact that you just simply don't like to read, that it's boring. And to that, I would like to say that according to Google's advanced algorithms, there are over 130 million different book titles in the world. So chances are you can probably find something you're at least a little bit interested in. Now, I'm not gonna stand here today and give you a million reasons why you should read simply because it's fun, even though it really is, or that you need to drop everything you're doing all day every day and read. But rather, I'm gonna give you three very specific reasons of why you all should be spending a little bit more time reading. Those three reasons are, first, you will become more successful. Second, you will improve your mental health. And third, you will have an increased spectrum of knowledge. So first, you will become more successful. According to the National Literacy Trust, as reading decreases, so does your grammar accuracy, your text comprehension, and your vocabulary breadth. That's huge. But on the other hand, as reading increases, so do all of those things. This is especially important when you realize that on Forbes' list of top 10 things that employers look for when hiring new employees, three out of those 10 things include being able to communicate verbally, second, being able to create and edit written reports, and third, having, having the ability to obtain and to present and process written information. Reading can help with all of those things. So therefore, reading can provide you with the skills that you need to succeed, not only in your careers, but as well as to help to contribute more to society. Second, reading helps to improve your mental health. Research done by the Business Insider shows that reading more actually creates existing neural pathways and brings them to life, which improves your actual brain power and increases your intelligence. Not only that, but it also increases your memory retention. Everyone, that doesn't only just help us now in school and in work, but that is also going to help us in the future. Especially when you realize that according to Alzheimer's.org, one in every 10 of us is going to suffer from Alzheimer's disease. That's a lot. But however, they also show that by stimulating your brain with reading and writing every day, that actually significantly decreases your, the rate of decline in memory. I know that that is not something that many of us are thinking about now, but it should be. And something as simple as reading every day can help to prevent that. Third, reading can help to increase our spectrum of knowledge. Warren Buffett, one of the most successful investors of all time, who, mind you, is now worth over $98 billion, was once interviewed by Forbes magazine. When asked what made him so successful in an interview, he pointed to a stack of books, and he said, read 500 pages like this every day. It, that, that is how knowledge works. It builds up like con compound interest. Not many of you will do it, but all of you could if you really wanted to. Now, I know that 500 pages is an insane amount, and I'm not saying that you need to do that, and you probably can't, but how many of us even read 10 pages a day? I do not believe that the information that the knowledge that Mr. Buffett is referring to will only help us in our personal lives, but will also help us to have a greater understanding and knowledge of the world around us, because that is exactly what reading can do for us. Not just fiction books, but nonfiction, science fiction, anything. You can learn so much. Um, we are fortunate enough to live in a country where our, our curiosities and our interests are not censored like they are in so many other nations around the world. We have the right and the privilege to be able to read and to learn about anything we want at any time we want. But do we use that or do we take it for granted? Being able to read about whatever we want and to learn about anything we want, we have the ability to learn about everyone around us and about the world and things that we don't understand and things that we oftentimes shut out. I myself have been guilty of this in my life. I have a dear friend who is very interested in the theory of evolution, but in my mind, anytime he brought it up, I couldn't talk about it because I could not believe in God as well as learn about evolution at the same time because in my brain, that just, those two just couldn't go together. So I would shut him out, I would turn it down, and I just would try and change the subject. However, a couple months later, I was in an airport, and I noticed a book called Sapiens, which is a New York Times bestseller, and it gives a brief history of humanity, including theory of evolution. I remember that conversation I had had with my friend and how I was so quick to turn down the idea of talking about something like evolution. And I decided to buy that book. And I read it, and guess what? I learned a ton, so much, and it was amazing. Now, did reading that book all of a sudden mean that I couldn't believe in God? Absolutely not but it did mean that I gained a greater perspective and a better understanding of something that I didn't before. And I could now go and have a conversation with my friend about something that he thought was interesting. 
Barack Obama once said, when I think about how I understand my role as a citizen, the most important stuff I think I've learned, I've learned from novels. It has to do with empathy. It has to do with being comfortable with the notion that the world is complicated and full of grace, but that there is still truth to be found, and that you have to strive and to work for that. And the notion that it's possible to connect with someone else, even though they are different from you. In today's society, we need people who are more willing to look past their own ways of thinking. Reading doesn't only teach us facts and science, no. It can teach us about love, about empathy, about adventure, and spark a creativity that we didn't have before. Imagine what could happen if people like President Trump read a book about what the Islam religion actually believes. Or if white supremacists tried reading a book like To Kill a Mockingbird. Now, I'm not foolish enough to think that that would magically change everything. But I also think that we're foolish not to believe that by simply turning outward and learning more about other people and other ideas through something as simple as reading couldn't help to improve the way that things are. So that is my challenge to all of you today, even all of you college students who I know are studying and reading as much as you can during finals week right now. Go find a book. Not only that, but encourage the people around you to read as well. It's the gift giving season, so rather than giving your uncle a really crappy sweater that he's probably never going to wear, find a book that he might actually be interested in. You can even start family and friend book clubs. And before you shut out that idea, it's actually really amazing to be able to read and to learn and to discuss things with your family and friends and the people that you care about. So once again, the reasons that you read are three simple reasons. First, it will help you to become more successful. Second, it can improve your mental health. And third, it will give you an increased level of knowledge. I promise you that this will not only benefit you personally, but it will benefit the people around you as well as future generations to come. Because I can promise and guarantee you that the future generations will be even more tempted to spend incredulous amounts of time hooked to their phones, televisions, and other technology. I'm not silly enough to to think that we have to get rid of those things and that we can't use those things, but I am imploring you to choose to prioritize spending a little bit more time in the pages of books before you spend even more time scrolling mindlessly through your friend's posts. Because after, as Dr. Sue says, the more you read, the more you know. And the more you know, the more places you'll go. Thank you. Lucy. Our final speaker this evening is Megan McKenzie Coles. Megan was born in Layton, Utah, and currently calls Kaysville, Utah her home. She's an elementary education major and a junior at Weber State University. Megan hopes to become an educator and wants to set up a nonprofit for education in East St. Illinois. She attended Richfield High School and her instructor for COM 1020 is Mr. Ryan Cheek. Her presentation this evening is titled, Ogden, a Sanctuary City. Megan. Okay, so I'm Megan Coles, and I'm going to be speaking today about Sanctuary Cities but more specifically why Ogden City should continue its progress in becoming a sanctuary city. This is Angie Ramirez. She's a citizen of Weber County and a daughter of undocumented immigrants. When she was 16 years old, she watched as ICE agents stormed into her workplace in search of her father. She watched them forcibly take him. She said of that experience, it was very dramatic. I was bawling. They were taking away my dad. The story doesn't end there. Soon after, her mother left in fear of the ICE, and she left Angie Ramirez and her four brothers alone to fend for themselves as children. Angie's story is sad, but it is not unique. Since the election of Donald Trump, deportation stories like Angie's have become more common. I work in an elementary school, and I have seen my students' parents disappear, and their siblings, and I have seen how it has affected them. 
Since Trump's election, ICE agents have cracked down on immigration. And that is why it is so important that Ogden City become a sanctuary city. That is why Mayor Mike Codwell of Ogden City said, it is his responsibility, it is our responsibility to take care of those within our community, period, undocumented or not. Now, in order for you guys to understand why sanctuary cities are so important and why they're so beneficial, you have to understand what a sanctuary is and what a sanctuary city is not. A sanctuary city is defined by its limit, limited cooperation with immigration enforcement. Those limitations look different from place to place and they vary depending on the legislation of the city. So for example, in Chicago, those limitations look like employees, their citizenship is not disclosed by their employers unless there's a warrant present. These limitations allow for unbiased arrests and unbiased discrimination. So I'll give you an example. Let's say an undocumented immigrant or a UI gets pulled over for speeding. The policeman runs their license plate and they realize that they have an outstanding unpaid parking ticket. So they make an arrest. Upon the arrest, they take their fingerprints and they send them to the FBI. This is a mandatory process that is done in every city, whether it's sanctuary or not. Those fingerprints go to the ICE once the FBI sees that they are undocumented. Then the ICE sends a request detainer. That's an important word, request, to the local law enforcement. This says that they would ask the local law enforcement to hold that person for an extra 48 hours so that they can start the deportation process. In any city, it is okay, it is within the rights of the law enforcement to deny that request. The only difference is, is that in sanctuary cities, it is encouraged, especially if the undocumented immigrant is a low priority immigrant or saying that their only crime is being in this country without documentation. How many of you have heard that undocumented immigrants bring in a disproportionate amount of crime into the United States? Can I see some hands? Awesome, well that is a myth. In fact, a study called the Marshall Project shows that in sanctuary cities where undocumented immigrants are protected, crime is significantly lower. The Marshall Project showed that though immigration rose 109% since 1980 to 2016, that crime in sanctuary cities went down 23%. It went down in assaults, in robberies, and in murders, all substantially. Sanctuary cities are safer because they involve trust within the community and the law enforcement. Here's another myth. How many of you hear that undocumented, undocumented immigrants are taking our jobs and ruining the economy? Can I see some hands? Perfect. That's also a myth. Um, in sanctuary cities, according to the CEM analysis of 2017, household medians earned over $4,000 more than their counterparts, or saying unsanctuary cities. That's not just for undocumented immigrants, but in white American households, that average goes up $2,000 more. The economy is better in sanctuary cities. Along with that, poverty is down 2.3% on average in sanctuary cities, and employment is up 3.1%. Time and time again, sanctuary cities have shown us that they are beneficial, not just to the undocumented immigrants, but to everyone within its borders. In the 2017 census report, they estimated that over 200,000 undocumented immigrants live in Utah. That number represents people, our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers, my students. And just like Meyer, <laughs> Mayor Mike Codwell said, it is our responsibility to take care of them. And now you have the chance. I urge you to support Mayor Mike Codwell in his efforts in making Ogden City a sanctuary city. Thank you. Megan, may I please call for one final round of applause for all five speakers this evening.
this time, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to request that Dr. Cherie Josephson and Mr. Mark Merkley please approach me on stage as we present the honorariums and awards to the five finalists this evening. Speakers, when you hear your name, if you will please come up one at a time to receive your award and for a photo with Dr. Josephson and Mr. Merkley. We begin tonight with Peter Eck. finalists. At this time, I would like to please invite Mr. Brent Parkin to join me on stage. Brent is going to speak to us this evening briefly on the Weaver Speaks Speech Showcase Endowment. Brent? Great. So good to be with you tonight and to hear these presentations. I just want to get a, a feel of what the, uh, the audience, I want to know by the raise of the hands, how many of you have benefited from a scholarship or cash award, whether you're a current student or a former student at any institution, raise your hand. Wow, that's good. I'll raise my hand too, because I went through school on scholarships. But anyway, my role here at Weber State University as Senior Development Director is to help bring in funds for scholarships, awards, programs, different things to help our students succeed. And it's very exciting to see the, the many uh, philanthropists in our community locally and also uh, nation, nationwide that help our students uh, with these scholarships. It's very exciting that this year I was able to help secure an endowment to help with the speech showcase. And what an endowment is, is it's funding to help provide the awards to those that are the, the winners of this prestigious award, speaking award, and it's through the speech showcase, the Weber Speaks, and possibly uh, a future a connection with the Walker Institute of Politics in their public service competitions. Um, what an endowment is, is it's, a, it's funds of $35,000 that comes in over a period of time, and then once we reach that endowment of $35,000, then we can award uh, about $1,600 each year to through various students at a minimum of $35,000 in the endowment. It basically pays 4% a year to help with the awards. So the minimum endowment is $35,000. 
what's exciting is that we have generated around 25,000 to fund this endowment. So we're about $10,000 short from me reaching our goal. And we have five years to reach that goal of 35,000. So what's exciting is many, a, a group of faculty and strong supporters of this program and administration of Weber State has helped set this up. So this money came from in, internally and we're also seeking funds from outside the university. But my role here tonight is to ask each of you if you're interested in helping support Speech Showcase or maybe you have an interest in, in another area that you could support. And so on your table, you received a card. Everyone got a card. And there's also a letter that explains it. And we're going to actually have a drawing tonight for some prizes. I have six prizes, but everyone is eligible to participate. It's not just those that or want to contribute because that would be illegal and I'd get fired and go to jail and then it would be get really ugly. But everyone has an opportunity to participate. So to participate you have to put your name, address, all your just the top part, fill that out to be eligible for the drawing. Now if you want to contribute, then you fill out the other and also put that in the drawing. So there's no discrimination on those donating, those that aren't donating, but we do need your information. So if you will fill that out and then at the we have our ushers and assistants are going to go around, pick those up and then we'll draw for the prize right at the end. Okay? Thank you. Brent. Before we get to the closing celebrations this evening, we are happy to partner with another element of our department, and we will be showing a trailer for the Wildcat Film Festival, which will be taking place next semester, April 12th. That is a Friday. We invite all who are here tonight to attend this event, which will feature films by Weber State students and area high school students as well. Please stand by for this trailer. What does he think about all this? His hands always felt like the inside of a barrel, emptiness and something stolen. <laughs> Do you really believe that? Can't win if you don't play, buddy. Who thinks we saved the arcade? for freedom of speech. 
has done things in the community, for the university, and for others that has exemplified the role and the power of public address as a means of garnering the change that is needed in the world. This semester, we honor Mark Merkley with the Freedom Through Rhetoric Award. Mark grew up in Blackfoot, Idaho, and attended American Fork High School. He later attended Brigham Young University, where he earned a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in organizational communication. He has had a distinguished teaching career, teaching at Utah Valley University from 1990 to 2001, Westminster College, from 1994 to 2001, Salt Lake Community College from 1990 to 2001, and most importantly, Weber State University from 2001 to 2018, a 17-year distinguished career. During that time, Mark taught public speaking and interpersonal and small group communication. He also served as the basic course director for the Department of Communication and was the founding director of Weber State Speech Showcase. The inaugural speech showcase occurred in spring of 2015. Possibly most important to his recognition tonight is the fact that Mark Merkley was the 1974 BYU Speech Showcase winner. He played baseball at BYU as well, but it is his participation and winning of that speech showcase that inspired him to bring a showcase to Weber State University so that other students who have done amazing things through public address could be honored like he was honored years ago. Given his support of the speech showcase, his work to begin and to continuously have this as a function for the department, for the university, and for the many years that he has spent educating the individuals who have made the attempt and who also holds the record as having the highest number of speech showcase finalists among all instructors in the Department of Communication. We, this year, honor Mr. Mark Merkley with the Freedom Through Rhetoric Award. Mark, would you join me? Up? received it up to this point are some excellent individuals and I am proud to be one of those individuals to receive this award and I promise you I will find a place to hang <laughs> this award in my home. Uh, and I want to say some uh, special words to the showcase speakers tonight. Uh, read the book Sapiens. I, I'm serious. Read the book Sapiens, and then after you read that, then read Dan Brown's book, Origin. Uh, the, there are messages in these books that have significant, almost horrifying uh, ramifications within it. We need to read these books. They are, they are most important. So, I, I, Lucy, thank you for, for bringing that book to, to bear. And uh, voting and the uh, legalization of drugs, uh, I like to use the word decriminalization uh, in that context as well. But I have some other words that I would like to say, and I'm sorry, I'm going to keep you here a while. Uh, <laughs> 
used to it. <laughs> but I want to be entertaining as well, and I need to move this out of the way or my, I might kick it somewhere, okay? Public addresses remain the top humankind's greatest fears. A, a recent poll stated that 8% of all people, if they had the choice of delivering a speech or dying, they would prefer to die. <laughs> now Dostoevsky observed that taking a new step, uttering a new word, is what people fear most. Now, is this fear a learned behavior? Well, I'd like for you to take a look at these partial lyrics from the stage play South Pacific. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. You've got to be carefully taught irrelevant fears, including the fear of public address. What is the opposite of fear? Is it bravery? Courage? I suggest to you that it is hardiness. Here's a term used by Dr. Fred Rowe to describe the traits of young people in the ghettos of America's largest cities, but who never gave in to drugs, gangs, or their environmental social circumstances. But this aspect of hardiness is a learned behavior, but it is not taught as well as fear. Fear paralyzes people, and we must encourage others to draw outside the lines or to take the path less chosen. To conquer fear is to make ourselves more valued as individuals in everything that we do. Nelson Mandela said, I have learned that courage is not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave person is not the one who does not feel afraid, but who has conquered that fear. Skydiving can help you to conquer fear and to become a better public speaker. Do you don't believe me? I'm serious. Years ago, I used to show this video entitled, You Pack Your Own Shoe, to describe Dr. Eden Ryle's first skydiving jump with all of her metaphors in regard to fear. And then I would say to students, you need to be like a skydiver, conquer fear, and then deliver superb speeches. That's pretty gutsy advice from someone who's never jumped out of an airplane. <laughs> so for my 40th birthday, I decided I'm going to go skydiving. And I invited friends, neighbors, and even students to accompany me. And one of those students was a gentleman, young man by the name of Jason, who, like I, is a type 1 insulin-dependent diabetic. But his condition was far more brittle. In his early teens, diabetes had blinded Jason. But nonetheless, he showed up at the skydiving facility with a seeing eye dog on one side and his father on the other. And if his, and if his father, I, I tell you, he was giving me death stares. <laughs> if looks could kill. I, I, so I, I helped Jason. He was matched with a good tandem jump master. And his plane was just taking off when I noticed his father and the seeing eye dog exit the hangar and he, they were approaching the landing area and I went up to him and I said, sir, I want you to know how much I admire Jason. He is a young man who has not been blessed with all of the gifts that most people possess. But he has hardiness. He is humorous, curious, inquisitive, seeks new experience and in a few moments he's going to be jumping from an airplane. He has done more than most people with sight. He responded, when Jason came home and said he wanted to skydive, his mother and I were not too happy. But we said to ourselves, to each other, he's been near death so many times, what's one more? <laughs> and at that time, the plane was at altitude. We saw these dots fall into the sky, parachutes deploying. A few minutes later, Jason came down to a safe landing, and I gave him a great big hug. 
And I asked, Jason, did you enjoy your jump? And he said, Merkley, I was so scared, I kept my eyes shut the whole time. <laughs> Three months later, Jason died from complications due to diabetes. I went to his funeral where once again I had the opportunity to confront his parents, and they welcomed me with open arms. They said, Mark, we are so happy that Jason went skydiving. We won't have Jason anymore, but we'll always have his skydiving video so that we can show other people the kind of person that he was. Jason's hardiness continues to inspire, even to this very moment. Now I would like to share with you the Weber Speaks Anthem. The Weber Speaks Anthem is a guide for the selection of relevant topics. But it is also a call response mechanism. And in a few moments, we're going to engage the Weber Speaks Anthem, in which I'm going to issue three calls, and you'll respond with the same two words, Weber Speaks. I just want you to concentrate on the calls. You don't need to respond right now, okay? <laughs> so don't respond just yet. The first call, when an answer to a problem is needed and hopefully with some vigor and some volume, you will respond, Weber speaks. The second call, whenever conflict or justice demand resolution, Weber speaks. And the third call, should fear threaten to silence the voice of freedom? Weber speaks. Past and current showcase speakers have not feared to answer a problem, resolve conflict, seek justice, or fail to be a voice for freedom. So here we are. We are now looking at the opportunities that are before us. And I want you now to consider these words. Whoops, take off, go back, here. They are slaves who fear to speak for the fallen and the weak. Words precede war. Speeches are delivered before elections or events occur. The best advice for public speakers is to light yourselves on fire, then invite people to watch you burn. <laughs> no matter how dim your light may be, let it shine. Use the energy from fear as a source of strength with an understanding that everyone feels fear. There is no measuring device for fear. Why? We all and each feel fear equally. And we must do what we fear, including delivering speeches. I, you know... <laughs> I don't care when you feel fear or how you feel it or why it comes to you or how strong you th may think it be. Just say to yourselves, WTF. Yes. What the fear? <laughs> feel it and do it anyway. You can be consumed by fear and still succeed greatly. Mm -hmm. Challenge conformity. Learn about yourself as well as especially about others. And when you feel these fears, then you need to understand that those people who came before you, those people who have made your lives most comfortable, climbed aboard their aircrafts of fear, attained altitude, looked out into the vast emptiness, unknown, possibly even darkness, then jumped. Our destiny, your personal destiny, belong to the intelligent and well-spoken. Never fear to speak 
for the fallen and the weak. Okay, we're ready to, to get the Weaver Speaks anthem done and then we can go home. Yes. We're ready? Okay, I'm here. One quick thing first. Yes. Do that. Okay. <laughs> Just a little bit with the really big award. <laughs> I'll never forget the day he brought the certificate to my office to sign that we were going to give to the uh, recipient at the Freedom Through Rhetoric Award. He rolled out this award certificate and I looked at the signature line and I wondered if I could even write my name that big. We also have this award, and it's signed by all the faculty, the full-time faculty in the Department of Communication, and it includes the programs from all of the speech showcases um, that were conducted when Mark Merkley was a faculty member here. So I'd like to thank Mark and congratulate him. <laughs> but I'll do it. I'm happy to do it. Just about there. Before we issue the callback for the Weaver Speaks Anthem, a couple of very short closing remarks. Tonight we saw just the power of public address. But today, a few hours ago, President George H.W. Bush, the 41st President of the United States, was laid to rest in Texas. And President Bush, in 1988, when he accepted the Republican National Convention's nomination, said in part, quote, I intend to speak for freedom, stand for freedom, and be a patient friend to anyone, East or West, who will fight for freedom. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we have seen students fight for freedom. And we have had the pleasure and privilege of honoring a man who has had a career fighting for freedom and the freedom for our ability to speak. Therefore, tonight we are privileged to have Mark Merkley with us, to have all of the speakers and class representatives with us, and you, the friends and family members who have made this a most memorable event. And the last announcement on behalf of Brent Parkin is after the Weaver Speaks anthem, if you would like to enter into the drawing, please drop your envelope off before you leave. It is now my pleasure to leave you with Mark Merkley, who not only adapted, but perfected the Weaver Speaks anthem, and who is going to demand the loudest callback in the history of the speech showcase. I hope that you will help him to achieve that tonight. You ain't going home till you do. <laughs> now, now, I want those people, especially down at the University of Utah, to hear us. You know, we, you know, my, my biggest hope is with the creation of this endowment that Ben Parkin has spoken to you about, is to develop some kind of a, a liaison, a relationship with the University of Utah. You know, just one final thought, you know, the University of Utah is going to kick our butts every time we play football. <laughs> but you know where we can compete with those kids? Speech. Public speaking, yes. Yes. Our speeches. And so we are going, we're, we're trying, we're working to get enough money so that we can participate in what we 
would call the hip versus whip talks <laughs> between the Hinkley Institute of Politics at the University of Utah and the Walker Institute of Politics here at uh, Weber State. And your money is most important. It really is. We're $10,000 short of getting that endowment established. And once we do, we can start doing some real fun, fun activities. So please. If there were 10, if there were uh, 100 of us here today who dropped $25 into the pool, you know we're almost we're, we're a quarter of the way of reaching our goal. We need to get there. And by the way, you mentioned uh, George Bush, uh, H.W. Bush. He skydived. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah. yeah he was a skydiver. <laughs> and, and I want you to know. You, you may say, Hey, Merkley, you talk a big game. But I, t I told all of my children, when you turn 18 and uh, graduate from high school, I'll pay for your first skydive. Three of my four children did it. Two of them are here. Spence, Derek, just let them know. They, they jump. And, uh, I'm not certain if I can say that skydiving made these two, two gentlemen great, but I, I will say this. You know, between the two of these young men, they have three bachelor's degrees and two master's degrees between them. They are good boys, and I think that skydiving <laughs> did have a part in that. But hey, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, you know what? <laughs> Okay, here we go. Come on, let's let those people hear it. All right, when, we, when I give the call, respond with vigor, gusto, and volume. Here we go. Ready? When an answer to a problem is needed, we are speech. Very good. Whenever conflict or justice demand resolution, we are speech. Should fear threaten to silence the voice of freedom, we are Let's make it happen. These events are concluded. And I hope there's one young lady here who will become, from Weber State University, who will become the first female U.S. Senator elected from the state of Utah. Is there any female? Yeah, okay. And I hope that when you're delivering your speech, you have a baby in your arms, show